Thank you so much for coming, for being with us today, and for those beautiful remarks about Bob. Um, we really, really appreciate it. All right, um, there's a lot that we want to cover, and we are very excited that you're here. Um, I'm sure that many, many of our students, Aurel, uh, and faculty are curious first to hear about your journey to the national security arena. Um, you are currently the first female director of national intelligence and oversee the entire U.S. intelligence community. But you've also held um, various senior posts as principal deputy national security advisor to the president, deputy director of the CIA. And yet, when we look at your undergraduate degree, you are a physics major. <laughs> So, at what, what wrong? I, <laughs> I know. What am I right? No, at no, what no. point in your career did you fall in love with national security? And maybe I should even start. How does it feel like to be back at Columbia after two years? Uh, it's wonderful. It, it, it feels like I've been off on a separate island for a while. Like I sort of came back to. It's really lovely to be back here and to see so many people that I haven't had a chance to yeah talk to. But I. Um, you know, nobody's ever really asked me the question in the way that you just did. I, honestly, it was a bit of a mistake, uh, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to acknowledge. But, um, but I, I loved physics and math. It was sort of what I was better at when I was younger. And, uh, and when I opened up a bookstore, a cafe, and became a business owner, which I thought to do while I was in grad school, which was a terrible idea, um, I, I started to learn about what it was like to be part of a community, and uh, it was really a different way of looking at the world, in mm -hmm. a sense. And I, I really enjoyed it. Although I will say that my my father at the time called my then boyfriend, who I was opening the business with, and said, "You know, this is a terrible mistake. She's she's good at math and physics, <laughs> but like you are going to have to support her if she goes down this other route. This is going to be <laughs> terrible." But it was, um, it was really, it was a sort of an awakening to public service and to what it means to be mm -hmm. a responsible participant in community. And then I, I ended up going to law school and getting a job in the State Department and, um, and I followed people that I respected and I kept on learning new things and feeling as if the work was consequential. And that's how I ended up in national that's security. security. Yeah. Wonderful, we're lucky that you are in this. Oh, uh, I, <laughs> In this business. So there's a lot of topics that we could probe here, but one that seems to be most on everyone's mind is Ukraine and balloons. We'll get to the balloons. Um, in political science, we'll be okay yeah. <laughs> no, we will, we will. Uh, in political science, we think of war, no matter of what the, the motivation, if it's greed or security dilemma or whatever it is. War by, the war by itself reveals information for both sides about the balance of capabilities, resolve, and so on. Which usually, with that kind of revelation, updating happens about war aims and strategies and so on. So I guess my question is two questions. Now, we've been in this war for almost a year now. Do we see any shift in strategic goals or war aims by the, any side, by either side? And second, what should we expect to see in the next couple of months um, on the battlefield, in your opinion? I mean, in terms of, of different strategic objectives, I think in, in some respects, both sides have become more dug in uh -huh. um, instead of it really instead of there being a clear shift mm -hmm. in uh, objectives. The, um, and in terms of what we're going to see in the coming months, so here's kind of a general assessment of where we're at. We're in what we call a grinding deadlock right now, where basically both sides are you know, pushing at each other. Neither has really definitive military advantage. And we're not expecting that either side is really capable in taking major territorial gains. We're seeing them move hundreds of meters some days, sometimes a bit more, but it's not significant right. in that respect. But we are also getting into uh, kind of the spring offensive potential perspective. And, um, and we are seeing Russia attempt an offensive right now, even though it's not moving particularly quickly. But 
both sides are experiencing some pretty significant challenges. And one of the questions is whether or not, for example, as the Russians are engaging in the offensive that they're in right now, how costly will that offensive be to them? Right. Will they, in fact, mobilize will be one of the questions. Personnel shortages is one of the clear issues. Will they be able to essentially um, set up supply lines for ammunition that will allow them to uh, you know, resupply in effect and to address some of their challenges on their mm -hmm. side. Um, and if it is costly and they're unable to do some of those things, that can present essentially opportunities for the Ukrainians. And if they are, that will make it more challenging, obviously. And on the Ukrainian side, they're relying just remarkably on Western assistance and aid, and that will be critical to their capacity to effectively move forward. And so we'll see how this continues in the coming months. But we'll be, I, I think the next you know, six months or so going through to the summer will be a, a critical period, essentially, for the rest of the trajectory of the conflict. And talking for a second, about surprises so far. No. So let's stay with that theme. So we talked about surprises, about, okay, the, the scope of his uh, revisionist intention, surprises about the Russians' ability to fight the military performance so far. There was surprise about Zelensky and the resolve of the Ukrainians and their ability to sustain um, the fighting um, and do so well uh, on the battlefield. And then there was a surprise around the cyber component of it, or lack of uh, uh, more active cyber um, warfare. We haven't seen NATO or the United States being the targeted in, in, in the way that we anticipated. So of all of these things that we've been surprised, what, what caught, you, know, what caught mm. you by surprise the most? I mean, I think I'll take through a few of the things yeah. that are on your list and then add maybe one or two. But I think one thing that um, we clearly have work to do in the intelligence community, and we've talked about this in, openly, but is there's sort of will to fight questions, yeah. which are very challenging, frankly, to assess. And we've gone through a variety of kind of learning lessons uh, pieces on this. But, um, but I think there's, I think we can improve, but I think there is a sort of a limit to what you can do in this space mm -hmm. effectively. Um, and then there is assessing the capacity of another military to execute right. on, uh, you know, essentially a mission. And, um, and in the context of uh, Russia, as you say, you know, I think this was an area where we did not um, assess what occurred in terms of the Russian capacity. And, and there were a lot of things that contributed to that that I think are actually quite interesting. And I, I won't go through everything, but I'll just name a few that I think are sort of fascinating. I mean, one that, that is perhaps obvious is um, while we indicated that we thought that uh, Putin and the Russian military was underestimating the resistance that they would encounter when they came into Ukraine, what we did not then follow through on in that context is, OK, they were actually planning for a different conflict than the one that they ended up in, right? So they planned for the short siege, and they didn't plan for the long siege, right? And you want different equipment, you want different approaches when you're going for that operation as opposed to another. So it's an example of one of the challenges. The other thing is that they, they did their planning in a very... Um, tight way. In other words, they were trying to keep it very close hold, right? right? And as a consequence, they weren't doing the normal, you know, what we would say, the interagency coordination, right? Like across the bar. So you can also see how some of the challenges can erupt when you don't think about, you know, if you don't have the right logistics folks in, the, right, like, you know, doing it. And I remember one of our generals saying, you know, when you're doing planning, it's it's really, it's two thirds of your time in working up the plan is the planning and one third for the decision making process doing it. And it's, and they could already see how that was sort of breaking down in different yep. spaces. So there, there are a number of things that kind of come into this, and I could go on, but we do find it intellectually fascinating, yep. and I think it is something that we can continue to learn. And it makes you realize, too, that, you know, to say on this point that um, 
it's not just about understanding the capabilities of a military, but it's actually about thinking about their capacity to execute against a particular mission and how they're looking at it and right. what they're doing in relation to it, right. Right? and all of these other things yeah. that you're sort of having to factor in to what your assessment is as to the capacity of them to actually follow through. One thing that you didn't mention that I'll just uh, mm -hmm. flag that I thought was quite interesting. You know, we, we did a lot of work, obviously, for the policy community in looking at um, sanctions, right? Yep. Like, what are the sanctions that you might right. uh, enact and, um, and what would be the possible impact of that and, you know, and so on. And one of the things we did not anticipate was the degree to which private companies, multinational com corporations that have a big impact, like all services production and so on, self-sanctioned afterwards, right? And, you know, that's an important yes. factor to think about and to understand uh, how that's going to develop. And that's something that, yeah, that we should have been thinking about and looking at. And it's kind of to my point of my remarks too, right? Getting out of our space and talking to folks in all walks of life and understanding better is critical to us getting better at our job. Absolutely. So uh, in the past year, I've been playing this game. What Bob would have been fascinated about the most uh, about this war? What would he have been written about? Or, and I think that one thing that I have a strong feeling that would have caught his attention is the decision early on to share intelligence mm -hmm. about the Russians. Um, plans to attack, to invade. And it's the, you know, we, we share intelligence with allies, but this was a little bit, it was different, right? The scope, um, sharing it not just with allies, with the public, with Putin himself. And I want to ask you about that decision because there were a couple of issues that, that comes up with the decision to share and reveal, disclose intelligence. One is obviously the issues about burning sources and methods, and how do you weigh that against the benefit? Another issue is thinking about the precedent that you are setting, because from now on, does it mean that when the United States wants to bring allies on board, it is going to be expected to share this kind of intelligence with them? And the third, that if you think about the, one of the goals of the, intel, of the sharing of disclosing was maybe to deter Putin, and that did not happen. So, so there were costs for this idea of, 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 of thinking about the sh sharing and disclosing intelligence. But there were obviously lots of benefits. And so if you can share a little bit about the decision-making process and how you weighed in all of those costs against the benefits and so on. We'd love to hear. Yeah, and, and can I just, on the precedent issue in the way that you mm -hmm. identified it, I, I mean, I have to say, I think that's already a precedent already. that was set. Like, I mean, in the sense that, and, and I'm not, and maybe this is not the right way to think about it, Karen, and I, I'd be, yeah. be interested in how you're framing it, but it has certainly been true that, um, that when we've asked allies and partners to work with us on responses to a variety of things that they want to know if we're saying that we're responding to a threat right right like where's the evidence mm -hmm. you know and um and in this context um part of the challenge and and maybe i'll go through the decision making process to to highlight this so and see what you think yeah, about this please, i please. because what what happened for us was we we were collecting information that that obviously led us to believe that something was happening here that that um, Putin was preparing for an option, a military option. And, um, and as we did this in the lead up, uh, you know, so in the fall essentially of uh, 2021, we had had a previous event, which folks may remember in sort of the spring period, the kind of March, April, May period, mm -hmm. um, where there'd been another buildup by the Russians, right? It wasn't as extensive as the one that we had in the fall, but it was a fair buildup. And we were trying to understand what that was about and whether that was setting up for a military option. But in many respects, it seemed as if going through it, maybe he was considering it, but, but it looked like in large part it was there to kind of bully a bit, you know, mm -hmm. to sort of yeah. use the military buildup right. as a way to coerce diplomacy in a sense. And, um, and so for many of the Europeans that we were talking to as we were then in the fall and seeing this different kind of buildup, the 
the concern was, well, it's just another example of what he was doing before, right? Why is it different now? What's the change? And why do you believe that he's going to do something? And and the there were sort of two pieces to this. The the um, you know the question was, okay, are we getting this right? But then also, if we are getting it right and we're working with Europeans, whatever the likelihood of this occurring is, would we? precipitate him doing something by virtue of the fact that we're working on response options, right? So because often what you do to deter also can escalate, right? And so the the challenge in the in the very first part was that we had to convince our own policy community, right? You know, we're we're providing information, we're testing it, we're saying is this actually does this seem right? And when we got to the point where the president said, okay, you know, Tony, Jake, I want you to go out there, start talking to allies, we got to figure out, is there a way for us to deter? Is there a way for us to plan for a response option? Because if this does happen, we're going to be ready for it, right? So they went out, and I remember it late, and they came back, and basically they said, well, they're really skeptical. Mm -hmm. Like many of the folks that we're talking to, you know, don't think that this is going to happen and are not really ready to plan. And that was when he turned to us and the intelligence community and said, you got to share. You have to get out there and start sharing because we've got to help them see what you're seeing so that they are ready to talk to us seriously about what to do. And, and I think, you know, in that context, it makes sense from those countries' perspectives to ask for what's the information that you're basing this on? Why should we be paying attention? Why should we take the risk, essentially, in the time and resources and so on to engage in this? So that's one piece of it. I would also say, you know, when you're sharing with allies, right, you're doing it in a classified form, right, you're not disclosing it publicly. It really was a separate issue as we were doing this, right, where we basically identified, you know, Putin was putting together pretext for an invasion. And, and at some point, the president said, uh, you know, we should disclose this, right? We should deny him the pretext for the invasion. And thought that made sense, right? Can, can we do that? So the first thing we do, exactly as you say, is sources and methods, right? Are we going to be able to protect our sources and methods? Because obviously, we're only as good as our sources and methods, right? We're not going to be able to continue providing you with this intelligence if we lose them. So we had to make sure that we could figure out a way to do this right. that would be protective of sources and methods. And it was a team sport in the intelligence community, which is to say we really, there was um, working together across the intelligence community to think through how we could put together information from open source, right. essentially. And that meant doing things like, you know, leveraging commercial imagery or, you know, sort of thinking about what is available in open source that we could look at that you would help bear, us. Right, so you don't burn this. Exactly. So I think we, we really, you know, and it's t way too early to tell. I mean, yes. we've, we've been asked, all of us in uh, testimony and in Congress and so on, you know, have you seen any degradation? And we haven't at okay. this stage. But that doesn't mean that we won't over time. And it, you know, this is one of those things that takes a while to yes, sort of see how it goes. Absolutely. But we've done a, a lot of work to try to protect that. I think on the precedent piece, you heard sort of my yes. theory of the case on this. And I think you know, in the pieces that, that I was worried about that you didn't mention are as follows. One is, in addition to sources and methods, I, as we're promoting disclosures of information for the policy community in support of their efforts, I did not want the intelligence community to be perceived as just a tool of policy, yeah, right? And this was exactly. something that exactly. you know we spent some time thinking about. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I went to the North Atlantic Council to put down the case, Tony and I talked and I said, I don't want to do this with you. I think it would be better if I did it separately. I brought the analysts with me and we answered their questions. We never cleared our talking points. We just laid it out mm -hmm. as we could. And then policy could come afterwards and have a discussion. And so we would sort of have a distinction between us. But this is a challenging thing that we're yes. constantly trying to think through how we manage it. Yeah. Very interesting. We can spend hours like, talking could. about and this, this, this is disclosure. Is I mean, this yeah. is fascinating. All right, so sh let's shift from Russia to China. Yeah. Okay, big question. So the fundamental question that comes up for students of world history, especially in your room and you know, pol with political scientists, we tend to think about patterns. And we tend to say to think, okay, so what can we learn from the Cold War? Mm -hmm. And this came up 
today in the panel on, on nuclear weapons and so on. Can we learn something about the interaction between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War that led to detente, let's say, in terms of how we think about the future of US-China relations? So what are the issues that, what were the factors that led to the emergence of the time? Well, we know there was parity in the correlations of forces, and we know that we had a series of crises, the Berlin, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that led to some, establish some rules of the games and so on. So that's one way of thinking about what do we need in order to get to this period with, uh, of the time with China. Others will say very different actors, very different environment, Cold War does not really serve us well in thinking about it. Where do you stand on this? How do you think about the Cold War as in, should inform and in what way it should inform our thinking about US-China? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's part policy and part intelligence, right? So yes. I, I, oh, yeah. I will try to do the analytic the, piece. The intelligence part, I know. You have to stay with you. No, 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 fair enough. Yes, fair but, enough. But I do think there's some interesting differences in, in um, and maybe I'll just reflect on a few. You've done a lot of work in these areas, too. You should obviously <laughs> tell me what you think, too. I love it. <laughs> I am... Um, one difference that is challenging, I would say, is that um, it, we had a lot of channels with, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was you know the Soviet Union and then Russia, et cetera, um, and built those up over time, and not to say that they were easy, and not to say that um, you know they always worked in the way that you wanted them to work, but but one of the challenges with China is that they tend to clamp down in a crisis and not talk, and um, and sort of providing for and developing those kinds of channels is harder. It's mm -hmm. it's been a, a more challenging. I know Secretary Clinton with others would yeah. I, Think about this and have views, but it is. Um, but that's you know, in terms of your sort of setting up for rules and, mm -hmm. and trying to develop right, right the important. sort of right. frameworks within which you try to manage escalation and um, and issues moving forward. There are obviously, and people have written on the differences between China and Russia in this moment, and you know, there are clear uh, contrasts. I think that are worth understanding. Not the least of which is that. You know, China, China's economic integration with us is just in a very different place, right? And there's a whole other dynamic that is important to the relationship, these issues. But, um, but there are also, I would say, you know, it, it is um, as we're trying to provide assessments to uh, the president and the, mm -hmm. you know, National Security Council and so on on these issues with China. Um, we are mindful of the fact that in, in almost every respect, China's timelines and perspectives mm -hmm. are very long term. Yep. That our, um, our efforts to lay things out um, is, uh, is sort of, it, there's almost an asymmetry in mm -hmm. the way in which our right. you know, political centers interact yes. um, on these kinds of questions. And, uh, and as a consequence, trying to help frame our policy efforts and uh, and for us, we're usually being asked, what are the impacts of you know what we're doing, and then how are the Chinese perceiving it, and does that give us greater challenges or opportunities in these moments? Um, it, it's uh, it, it's rather uh, difficult to pull out for them what are the opportunities for you to shift their thinking, thinking right. exactly in ways that are consistent with the way we operate mm -hmm. effectively and um but it is it's a really it, it's been a very interesting thing among other things to watch i think she has been obviously in charge for quite some time now you know sort of how he's developed yes. over time and how that's shifting and watching the third party congress other things so i don't how do you think about this we have the, i mean People, people are not here to hear what I think oh, about it, but we'll, we'll, we'll be talking be about this. Yeah. We have dinner to, okay. to, to, to talk okay. about it. All right. And the next question is very much uh, very relevant to the research I've done, which is this, how does the intelligence community think about and assess political intentions, long-term intentions of adversaries? And why do we see the patterns that we see in assessment over time? 
and, and even the disagreements within the intelligence community. And gets, that gets me to, the, again, the issues of assessment of China's intentions. So your office put out a threat assessment that says about China's intentions that the Chinese commun Communist Party, the CCP, will continue efforts to achieve President Xi Jinping's vision of making China the preeminent power in East Asia and a major power on the world stage, a major power on the world stage. But the national security uh, strategy from 2022 says that Beijing's the ambitions is to become the world's leading power. Now, for the untrained eye, this may seem like splitting hairs, right? But from a, a perspective of a political scientist, the ODNI assessment sounds very much like multipolarity. Great power out of several great powers. Whereas the national security strategy reads very much like replacing the United States as the hegemon, unipolarity. So for me, this is fascinating. It's very relevant to the work that I've done. What accounts for the differences? What are the implications? Do they point to a disagreement within the intelligence community about China's intentions and, and so on? I, so I think it's really more a question of timelines. In other words, right. from, from our assessment, it's not that our assessment would be uh, in tension with the national security strategy, because I think over time, China is looking to be the leading power. And we have kind of a, a claim on that. It, it's just so looking out longer, for a longer uh, term. Okay. But, the, um, but I would say a couple things. I mean, I, it, it, that is also not to say that it wouldn't be fine if there were tension, right? Like, exactly. Because from my perspective, normal, yeah. totally. Yeah. And, and it, it, you're right that you know, one of the things, and Bob would talk about this a fair amount and, and was worried that we were not reflecting dissents enough in our yes. analysis and pushing that in. And I think that's a very fair concern. And we've been actually trying to do that because I think it actually helps people who are reading uh, the work understand better. Yes. Sometimes how did the analyst come to a certain decision where there are these differences of opinion that lie? So, so we have, you know, obviously we have a big community, we have different views, we try to reflect that. But it is also important, I think, to preserve the, the understanding that we may come to an assessment and the policy community can disagree. That's right. perfectly fine, right? They, they have the benefit of our views and they look at it and they say, no, we don't think so. So we're going to take a different uh, you know, assessment, essentially, for themselves and work on that basis. But in this case, I would say it's not really, I think, a, not a, a real... not a disagreement, but more yeah. of a time frame. So anything about uh, Xi's order to the military to plan for a successful invasion of Taiwan uh, by 2027, uh, can you talk a little bit about what does... That, that announcement, you know, what does it do for your assessment of thinking about it? How do we portray the intention? Does it make sense to talk about a 2027 date? Because it's coming up again and again, even in Bill Burns' uh, statement lately. Yeah. I mean, look, I, we assess that China continues to preference basically a peaceful you know, unification of Taiwan with China. We think that that is what they would prefer. I think the challenge is that they are likely becoming increasingly uh, pessimistic or skeptical that that's something they can achieve peacefully. Right. And, um, and, you know, we have been open about the fact that they are looking to uh, essentially um, achieve military uh, capacity so that they could take it militarily over our intervention. And that's ultimately if and when they are able to do so from their perspective. And I think, you know, it's important for, from an analytic perspective for us, right, that one of the key things is actually when do they think they can do it, right? Not when do we think they can do it. That will be an important factor in their decision making, and it will give them, you know, leverage and an option that they haven't had before, and that will matter. So, whenever that is, then that would be, yeah. Now, I definitely would not be doing my job today if I did not ask you about the surveillance balloons. <laughs> so, I don't think that I even need to unpack what what we're talking about. So, let me ask you this: a quick yes or no? Do you? <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> no, 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 I'm not about to ask what you think I'm about to ask. 
A quick yes or no, do you think the outcry over the balloon issue is exaggerated? What's the outcry over the balloon? How would you characterize uh, you it? Don't have, uh, <laughs> well, you don't, you, I have been approached by people now um, constantly about, oh my God, this, you know, what are the Chinese doing? But this is spy wars for, we just, this time we had to reveal what's going on because open source and digital era, we didn't have that luxury, you know, we had more luxury during the Cold War to decide what we want to reveal about things like that that were happening. Here the intelligence community was kind of forced to say more, the policymakers, and there is panic about what is happening. So do you think it's exaggerated? Do you see similarities to the uh, psychological effect of the Sputnik and the, the missile gap era? How, do you, how should we think about this? How, if you can, whatever you can say about the balloon, please. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so crazy. It's really like an episode of Veep, you know, on some level, like I'm just like trouble with this. I, look, I think um, as has been true historically, as you sort of allude to, right, when, when a country is caught spying in a clear and obvious way, right, like another country responds to it. And I right. think that's appropriate. And, um, and it is, uh, you know, so I, I think that it's perfectly reasonable to have a clear and forceful reaction mm -hmm. to a Chinese high altitude balloon, you know, flying over the United States and uh, surveilling us. I think um, uh, I think there is a question of as technology improves, as we start to see more high altitude mm -hmm. uh, vehicles in effect, um, that we're going to see more of this, and we're going to have to right. understand that and um, and manage it. And I think you know the president. And out yesterday kind of gave people a sense of, look, we're going to put this into a frame. We're going to figure out what our principles are. Right. We are going to work with our allies and partners to ensure that we're all on the same page. And, and I think that's, you know, a pretty classic and appropriate way to handle it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about threat assessment more broadly, not just with regards to China and Russia, but also thinking North Korea, Iran, definitely. We all know the JCPOA is practically that. But if you think about our ability or the intelligence community abilities to track and monitor nuclear capabilities, again, thinking about the Cold War, the 1138 uh, NIEs that were all about uh, tracking Soviet nuclear capabilities, it was, uh, the, the pattern was overestimation followed by underestimation and overestimation and so on. So compared to the days of the Cold War, have intelligence capabilities and new technologies really improved our assessment and our ability to uh, track those nuclear technologies? How confident should we be? Uh, especially as we think about countries, like, you know, China, Russia for sure, but also Iran, North Korea. Can you s say something about that without revealing too much? Yeah, I try to say something that's useful or interesting. I, I think we've definitely gotten better at um, uh, detecting, you know, the status of programs as a general matter related to nuclear issues. But, but it is also true that, you know, um, as we advance, so do others, right, in, uh, you know, in developing ways to avoid detection. One of the advantages of the JCPOA was that it gave us effectively through the IEEA and otherwise like um, the capacity to monitor and access for doing that exactly. and that increases our capacity to be able to continue to detect and uh, and so that is definitely one of the challenges but I would also say that I mean one of the most difficult spaces in the sort of weapons of mass destruction area mm -hmm. is really in the bio area. The bio, and I think, yes. you know, for, for us, like as we continue to try to yeah. better understand um, what is possible there and, uh, and to monitor that, it's really hard. I, this is just a brutally challenging area. And it's just with such um, mm. little uh, investment in a mm -hmm. sense, yeah, one right. can do quite a lot and, uh, you know, and it doesn't have a radioactive isotope attached to it or, you know, other things that you're able yeah. to. So it's, um, yeah. Okay. 
Very optimistic. Yeah, I know. I'm, I am uh, like Debbie Downer yes, for pretty much exactly. every. Yeah, it's <laughs> not a good. So let's yeah. shift gears entirely. Looking around, we see a whole new generation of digital natives, a diverse cohort of young people with the appetite for public service. Um, to what degree and in what ways are the realities of the digital age influencing recruitment strategies? Um, how best to attract younger generations of the types of skill sets and ex experiences you would look for in new hires? Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, no, I definitely, and, and honestly, this is, um, this is an area of passion for me. I, it, the, um, the thing that keeps me up at night is basically whether or not we're going to have the most talented, diverse uh, population in our public institutions and that we're actually able to be agile enough to address the challenges as they evolve over time and they're coming at us that much faster, more complex and everything else. And, and across the community, if you talk to every head of an mm -hmm. intelligence agency or department, they will tell you that recruiting and retaining a diverse and talented workforce is the most important thing to them. And, um, and we are uh, trying to get out in a variety of ways. I actually, before I came here, knowing that I would be in New York for a few hours, I went to Bronx High School of Science. Like I am, oh, like I'm trying to get out to different parts of the country, and you know, just do a short stop in mm -hmm. high schools and in other places to try to help people who um, haven't thought about the intelligence yep. community. You know, to think about it, to come in, to say if you're, you know, worried about it, if you think that all we do is. Uh, spy on people you uh, think of as heroes, like come in and, you know, see what it's like and help to make sure that you're part of the decision-making apparatus so that you can actually make it into the intelligence community that you want it to be. And I think it, it is one of the things that's hardest for us in, in the intelligence community, of course, is that it's really hard for people to know what is the work like, who do we talk to, how do we put, right? Like, what's that going to be? It seems like a black box. And so what we tend to get is folks who know people or are related right. to people or go to the same schools with, right? So it, it's so important for us to break out of that and yeah. to get out to others and to try to bring in the extraordinary talent that we have in the country today. So that's, that that's is so important. Yeah. And, and we here at Columbia at CPI, the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, this is a big mission of ours to, and we have a program, Emerging, Scott, Emerging Voices in National Security, especially for women and underprivileged minorities um, to come and, and learn about the, the world of national security and, and create this pipeline because we know that this is important. Yeah. So last question, because I know we're time. Besides thinking about recruitment, what keeps you out at night, up at night? <laughs> well, I said it. I, it truly it is. is. It is about having just sort of the resilient, agile institutions with the best possible people. And that is something that we are going to have to work really hard. And it is not easy to do in government. And it's getting harder. I mean, things like you know the politicization around budgets and other things like that just make it so hard to plan long term, to think through issues that help us build up the capacity that we know we need. And, um, and getting these partnerships with academia, with others, you know, to make sure that we are not in the group think mode and that we are capable of growing and innovating the way we need to do. So I'm, I'm really grateful, not to Bob Jervis most of all, obviously, in honoring him, but to you, to everybody, to President Bolger, I, because Columbia is the kind of environment that really helps to feed our work. And you know we learn from all of you. So we're very grateful for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Hank. This was wonderful.